When you look in a mirror, what do you see? Well, hopefully yourself. Except it's not really yourself, is it? And I'm not just saying that because it's a reflection, not a living thing. But what I mean is that it's a mirror version of yourself. And it's non-superimposable. The same can be said about your left and right hands. They're non-superimposable. Now, the interesting thing is that these concepts also apply to chemical compounds. And this includes DNA, RNA and proteins. The building blocks of life. DNA twists one way around, not the other. It's a right-handed helix, not a left-handed helix. And proteins follow a similar handedness. There are so-called L-amino acids that make up proteins, not D-amino acids, with L and D-amino acids being mirror images of themselves. Now the thing is, it could have quite easily been the other way around. We could have L-DNA and D-proteins, as these mirror image systems are independent from life, as far as we know. As in, they would still perform the same function, it would just be a reflected version of it. And so, it wouldn't just be another branch on the tree of life, it would be a completely new tree. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to explore a bit further this concept of mirror image biology, and discuss some recent work that's exploiting this knowledge to be able to store DNA, as this mirror image version may be better at storing DNA information than its natural form. But this comes with its own complications. So to begin with, let's take a look at this mirror image biology and explore further these concepts that I've just been spurting out, such as right-handed and left-handed DNA, and L proteins and D proteins, as this concept is that one thing you must remember, or nothing that follows will seem wondrous. So that concept that I'm alluding to is known as chirality, and it's a property of asymmetry that's important in several branches of science. And so the definition is that if an object or a system is chiral, it is distinguishable from its mirror image. That is, it cannot be superimposed onto it. And so you have a chiral object and its mirror image, and together they're known as enantiomers. And so chirality is a feature of DNA and proteins, well, and RNA as well. And so in the case of proteins, this figure shows it nicely, whereby you've got an amino acid, which is a building block of proteins, and you can see here both of its enantiomers and how they're mirror images of each other. You can't actually superimpose them onto each other. And so one of these versions is known as L-amino acids, and that makes up all of the proteins that are found in our natural world. And then the other version, this mirror version, is known as D-amino acids. And the fact that all amino acids in a protein have the L version gives proteins the property of homochirality. And this term can also apply to DNA, whereby each nucleotide, which makes up DNA, is of the D-nucleotide version, not the L-nucleotide version. And so this right versus left-handed, D versus L, refers to how chirality was initially defined for chemicals, whereby if polarised light is passed through a chiral molecule, the light is either rotated clockwise or anti-clockwise. So if it's clockwise to the right, it's known as dextrorotary, whereby if it's anti-clockwise to the left, it's known as level rotary. And so I might interchangeably call them D and L or right and left. So you've got L for left and D for right. So hopefully you are now familiar with the concept of chirality, because I don't want to lose you now, because now we're going to look at what this mirror world of biology could really mean. Well, technically, we're first going to look at our world of biology and the so-called central dogma that underpins, well, not everything, but a kind of central process that goes on within ourselves, and that is gene expression. And so the central dogma was termed by Francis Crick, which describes the process by which the information in DNA are converted into a functional product. And the stages of that are first the transcription of DNA into RNA, which is the messenger that takes it out of the nucleus and the cytoplasm, where that message is read by the ribosome and translated into protein. Now, I've just summarised a whole load of biochemistry into a very short sentence, so apologies. But all we need to know is that we've got DNA, we've got RNA, and we've got protein. 
And how we go between these different stages depends on RNA molecules and they depend on enzymes, enzymes being proteins. And now we can go back to talking about chirality and how we have D-DNA and we have L-proteins and how this whole process depends on interactions between proteins, RNA and proteins and DNA and RNA-DNA interactions. And so they have kind of co-evolved together. I mean, the origin of these different molecules is a video on its own, but they've evolved together such that the system wouldn't work if you then had D proteins instead of L proteins. And so to summarize that a little bit into a sentence, it would be to say a living system usually deals with two enantiomers, so the mirror image and the original, of the same compound in drastically different ways. And so the mirror world of biology is the hypothesis that if our world works, then the mirror versions of each of these components would also work and fulfill the central dogma. However, a mirror image form of life has not yet been discovered, but the individual components can be created. So why would we want to further understand this mirror world of biology? And does it have any potential therapeutic use or any other uses that might be interesting? So there are many potential practical applications of mirror image biochemistry. For example, because as I've mentioned, a living system would usually deal with the mirror image version and the normal version in completely different ways. It has the consequence that our body's molecular machinery wouldn't necessarily recognise the mirrored version of, say, DNA or RNA or proteins. And so one, that could mean that they're resistant to enzymatic degradation and so their half-life within the body could be longer. And it could also potentially avoid triggering immune responses making them attractive drug candidates. And indeed, many mirror image peptides, so parts of proteins, have already been investigated as potential therapies for different diseases, such as cancer. And one peptide was also made, known as FOXODRI, which was shown to have senolytic activity. And so we'll revisit this idea later, due to the fact that, especially DNA, is resistant to enzymatic degradation, it could have potential as DNA storage. But like the structure of DNA, there's a twist. And the twist is that if you want to mass generate this mirrored version of DNA, you need enzymes to synthesize the DNA. The most efficient way to do this is to have enzymes that can synthesize the DNA and then have other enzymes that you can use to sequence the DNA and check that you, that you got it right. And so these enzymes are proteins. And so these proteins have to therefore be the D proteins, not the L proteins, because we're in the mirror world. But to get to the proteins, we need to have the DNA that encodes the proteins that can then go to the intermediate of RNA that can then get translated to produce the protein. And so where do you begin? And how do you begin? And how do you begin to even think about the ribosome, which is this huge complex, which mediates the translation of the RNA code into protein? itself made up of different RNAs and proteins. It's a big challenge. But I suppose it is why I found this recent Nature publication so interesting and decided I had to talk about it. Because when I said it's a big challenge, it is a challenge. However, at the moment, there are ways that we can chemically synthesize short fragments of DNA and short peptides. However, it's just not very efficient. And so a couple of labs are looking into ways of being able to create the mirrored image version of different DNA polymerases. So create the enzyme first synthetically, because with one enzyme you can create a lot of DNA, and then you can then have that DNA to then make other proteins, although actually we're not really there yet, but you get the gist. But this will make a lot more sense when we look at exactly what they did in this Nature publication. So what they wanted to do was to chemically synthesize the mirror image version of the 775 amino acids, hyperthermostable, high fidelity DNA polymerase. And this is from the species Pyrococcus furiosus. And so the L version of this polymerase is commonly used in the lab, especially in PCR reactions. So it's a way to amplify DNA. And so it's basically a very useful tool to have in molecular biology. And so it'd be very useful, therefore, for developing the mirror image world. But the caveat is that this protein is 775 amino acids long, whereas currently there are limits on how big you can chemically synthesize proteins. 
with anything larger than 400 amino acids being very challenging to do. So to overcome these problems, the authors had to be quite clever. And so what they did is firstly, they split up the protein into two fragments in a way that they know won't really affect his enzymatic activity. And in addition to aid with the chemical synthesis, they made some substitutions, so swapping some amino acids for other amino acids, that helped to aid in the purification of the protein during the chemical synthesis. And so bottom line, they were able to create this 90 kilodalton high fidelity mirror image DNA polymerase. Now, the interesting thing about this paper is what they then did with this polymerase. Firstly, they showed that with this mirror image polymerase, they could assemble the DNA gene encoding the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And so this brings us closer to approaching potentially the reconstruction of the ribosome. More interestingly was the fact that they also used the system to show that it could work just as well as the normal system in DNA storage, if not better. So just to back up a little bit, DNA data storage is the idea that we can use the DNA sequence to encode large amounts of digital information in an enzyme-driven, sustainable and low-cost approach, with the idea that DNA, being quite dense and durable, could be a better alternative to storing a large amount of data in a small amount of space. And so what needs to be done is having some way of converting the binary digital codes into the four-letter nucleotide code. But that conversion is the easy bit. The bigger challenge is making sure that the DNA is biostable and that that same information can be recollected after a passage of time. And so what they did in this paper is actually compare the ability of DNA information storage in the normal version of DNA with the mirror image version of DNA. So what they did is they took 100 base pairs of either normal D or the mirror imaged L version of DNA And this was encoding information about a sample collection. In this case, it was a pond in Beijing. And what they did was they put these DNA fragments into some water from this pond. And so this water contains all kinds of, I know, weird bacteria and stuff in it. And so they wanted to see if the information stored in the mirror image DNA could have fade biodegradation and contamination from natural environments. And so what they found was that the LDNA barcode retained the information about the sample collection for up to one year and potentially longer than that, whilst the information stored in the DDNA, so the normal DNA version, could not be retained after just one day in the same conditions. And so the rationale for this is that the enzymes present in the pond sample that degrade DNA recognise the D version of DNA, not the mirror image L version of DNA. And so therefore, DNA storage is a potential application of LDNA. But another interesting application they show, I think here just a bit for fun, is the idea that LDNA could also be used for steganography. Now, this was actually my favourite bit of the paper. And so steganography is a way of hiding messages in plain sight. In fact, I can demonstrate this because I actually put a hidden message in this video, whereby earlier on in the video, I said, because I don't want to lose you now, which is actually some lyrics from Justin Timberlake's song, Mirrors. Now, that's probably not the best example. Actually, it probably isn't even an example of steganography, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what steganography is. And so what they did here is exploit the ability to store information in DNA, but have the DDNA version encoding the background message with an inserted fragment of LDNA encoding the hidden message. And so the idea is it's hidden in plain sight. And the reason it's hidden is because LDNA requires different methods to sequence the DNA sequence. Because again, the way we sequence DNA depends on enzymes. Enzymes are proteins and and those proteins recognise DDNA, not LDNA. And so there are two different methods to sequence the DNA. And so if you just use the conventional approach, you would miss the hidden message. And so if only the DDNA part was sequenced, it would reveal the false message error, whilst using the mirror image method of sequencing, it would reveal the secret message mirror. So this is a genuine example of steganography. Anyway, by being able to generate the mirror image version of this DNA polymerase in this publication, they demonstrate that they've expanded the mirror image molecular toolbox for potential applications in biotechnology and medicine. As I hinted to earlier, a big major hurdle in this mirror image biology system is to be able to create a functional mirror image ribosome, and so I think that's where future work is being focused on.
And this just leaves us with one final thought. Why is life's chirality the way it is? Could it be down to chance, or could it have been triggered by a fundamental asymmetry in nature? And how do we know that it's not there, if we can't necessarily sequence these strands by normal metagenomic techniques, as in, we're not actually looking for them, how do we know that they're not there? Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So maybe there's a mirror world under our noses and we just don't know it. Anyway, I hope you've learned something in this video about the mirror image world of biology. Let me know your thoughts down below. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.